The Tolkien Road, Episode 165, The Hobbit, Chapter 17, The Clouds Burst. Welcome in to The Tolkien Road, Episode 165, The Hobbit, Chapter 17, The Clouds Burst. Greta, Yikes. Greta, what's up? Hey. Um, not, not a whole lot. Cool. Yeah. How about you? What's up with you? Just about the same. Yeah. Just chilling. Just. Getting ready to talk about some Tolkien. 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 Yeah. Talking about the Hobbit. Talk about clouds bursting. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, I haven't mentioned this a long theme song. Trying to talk (laughs) while the theme song exhausts itself. (laughs) Maybe need to edit it down. So... Yeah, today we're going to be talking about The Hobbit, Chapter 17. We are nearing the conclusion of The Hobbit. This is uh, the third to last chapter. So yeah, that means we have three more after this, or no, two this, more? this is the third to last chapter. Okay, so we only have two more chapters. This is 17, then there's 18 and 19. Woo! Yeah, so... We just sailed through that, didn't we? Uh, we are sailing through it. Well, we are currently sailing through it. I wouldn't say we sailed through it from the start, but... No, but we, we kind of hit a stride here we recently. Did. Heck yes. A sprint to the finish. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, yeah, but even after that, we're going to have some more good stuff to talk about with The Hobbit. We've, oh, of we've course. Kind of the, the topic of The Hobbit, we have not yet exhausted. There's still a good bit more to discuss there. So, uh, so yeah, some exciting exciting stuff to come, um, which I'm really looking forward to after yeah. we complete The Hobbit itself. So... Uh, Before we dive in, a couple of things to take care of, a few items of business up front, as always. Uh, Please consider supporting the show over at Patreon, patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Don't forget to pledge $1 or more per episode, and you can set a monthly limit when you do that. So, hey, if you just want to give one, that's cool. If you want to give five, and you maybe you just want to give five and just limit it to one episode, you've got all different kinds of flavor combinations you can do here, people. Mm. So whatever you're... Like Baskin Robbins. And it all tastes delicious to us. Mm-hmm. So... Exactly. Yeah. So... What a perfect analogy. Help us out. Help yourself, help yourself out. Help us help you. Help others in the Tolkien fandom world. And we'll all just be one big happy family helping each other out. Because that's what Tolkien fans do. All right. True that. We help each other out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and and so um, we did have some. Oh, also, don't forget us. Don't forget to rate us. I'm I'm so bad at the intro <laughs> stuff. I don't I don't reference my notes. I just get going. You know. Uh, don't forget us to rate us on iTunes and uh, or whatever app you use to listen. Those five star ratings are the easiest way you can help get the word out about the Tolkien Road. Did you know that, Greta? I didn't know that that was the best way, but yeah. now I do. I don't. Well. Yeah, I'm not sure how you could know that because I say it like every episode. Oh, maybe I've kind of tuned me tuned out. Tuned you out. Yeah, it's a story of my life. Hopefully, All our right. uh, listeners haven't. Maybe, maybe next time I should do the intro stuff. Maybe, maybe I will. Just maybe, to kind of mix it up a little do bit. Do the intro stuff yourself. Maybe I will. Gosh. All I right. Can, I can make it super fun. Hey, you know what? what? Latron Prime, he's back. <gasps> he back heard our cries. L- Latron Prime is back Yay. in action. It was a pretty. It, it, you know, it it wasn't much. It was just to announce that, uh, lo, that the Amazon show, the Amazon Middle Earth show, has apparently found an executive producer and the person who is going to direct their first two episodes, and it is one J A Bayona, J A hmm. Bayona. I don't Juan, know anything about Juan him. Juan Antonio Bayona, apparently. So I didn't. i I'd never heard of him before either. Um, but here's. Here's the lowdown. We'll have a link to this in the show notes. Uh, but coming from, let's see, this is, uh, I'm reading this from Deadline, which is like Hollywood news and stuff like that. Okay. So Amazon Studios high profile, the Lord of the Rings TV series has made a key hire. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom director Juan Antonio Bayona has been tapped to direct the first two episodes of the big scope fantasy drama following in the footsteps of Peter Jackson, who directed the feature adaptation of the classic J.R.R. Tolkien novels. So, wait, is that is Fallen Kingdom, is that the most recent Jurassic World? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I liked that one. Yeah. I've liked them all. 
I mean, it's a popcorn movie. But, yeah, it's a popcorn but movie. I was reading up at, about still good. about his history, and I have an ex. I, Fallen Kingdom is the only thing I've seen that he's done, but but he's done other things. He has, and apparently, the stuff from before Fallen Kingdom, uh, were you know it they weren't as high profile uh, works, but. They apparently has they had, had pretty good reputations, right? Oh, okay. Um, it sounds like he's maybe uh, buddies with Guillermo del Toro, who is a filmmaker I really mm-hmm. love. I think he's one of the best filmmaker filmmakers out there these days. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so uh, it, the stuff he did, pre, you know, Jurassic World. You don't expect something in the Jurassic World movie, you know, uh, series to be like great cinema or something like that, right? It, but apparent, but. In, in the sense of like, wow, this is like mind blowing. It's supposed to be a popcorn movie, right? Right. It's supposed to right. make a bajillion dollars and be a popcorn movie. But it's encouraging to me to see see he can do do both that. But I enjoyed it for what it was, and he can also do, you know, works that are a little more deep and and just kind of you can that that have a better critical reputation maybe. So, so that he did he has done some of those things yeah in the past. and again I, I don't actually know any of these myself let me see if i can uh let's see bayona if it'll if he'll come up here j a bayona no some city in uh somewhere Ponte Ver- vedra it, it, oh. it, that may be in uh, spain here we go oh, j a bayona is. um it says he made a movie called a monster calls and then the impossible and then the orphanage it looks like his films kind of have a um sort of a a dark fantasy aspect to him which hmm. seems perfect that, right yeah that would work seems mm-hmm. perfect so i'm excited to see what this will mean for us uh, i may even go back and check out some of these movies to see what this means because it it doesn't come right out and say this in the article but it it sounds like he may be um you know he he may he may have a pretty important role on the show overall right um so uh, and it mentions some of the other writers in the writers' room. So there's these two writers, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, who have been around for a while. Not too much is known about this, but they lead a writers' room, which is believed to include Breaking Bad alumna Jennifer Hutchinson. You had uh, me at Breaking Bad yeah, alumna, seriously, and uh, Game of Thrones veteran Brian Cogman, um, who I think is the one we mentioned previously, yes, who yeah. was kind of like the the resident nerd for the Game of Thrones right. writers, right? So who did all the fact checking? Uh, yeah, I think these are good signs. I okay. think these are good signs. Good. Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, Bayona's first feature film, critically acclaimed thriller, The Orphanage, executive produced by Guillermo del Toro, premiered to a 10-minute mm. standing ovation at the 2007 Cannes Film Festival, and later won seven Goya Awards in Spain, including Best New Director. I think we just figured out what we're doing tonight. What's that? We're going to watch that movie. Oh, we're going to watch The Orphanage? Acclaimed thriller. Acclaimed. That's like right up our alley. Yeah, maybe we should. We should. We're going to get to the bottom of this, Bayona fella. <laughs> if it's the last thing we ever do. That's right. You said this wasn't much from Latron, but I feel like this is big news. Well, it wasn't actually his news, but it it like it, it Latron himself was all Latron did was t- retweet this. Oh, and then say so. Who originally tweeted it? Welcome to our Latron Prime Fellowship. Um, I think it was put out by different news outlets. Got it. I see. Okay, and yeah. Latron just retweeted. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, at but, least we know he's still alive. But that makes it official. It right? does. It does. That's true. Not uh, you just hearsay. Latron would not have retweeted this. And welcomed him to the fellowship unless, mm-hmm. I mean, what's he going to do? Be like, psych, not welcome to the fellowship. <laughs> um, April Fools. Yeah. So we at least know July. that we at least know that Latron is still alive. So that's very exciting. Latron. Good stuff. We're glad that you live. Things are moving forward. Is there a projected like air date, like a year or month or something? 2020. 20. Okay. That's all we really know that's right next now. Year. 2020, I believe. And okay. Now that I've said 2020, I'm thinking 2021, but I think it's 2020. 2021, what you think about us? Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Boy. <laughs> Actually, I missed it. it. was supposed to be, what you think about me? That was, I messed that song up. Sorry, Ezra. Boy. I'll do better next time. All right. Uh, Moving on. How's our poll? The poll? Is it closed? The poll is pulling along. Oh, it's not it's not closed yet. Not not closed yet. You know me. I'll I'll get around to closing. <laughs> when I get we just want closing. everyone to have a fair shake. If they're patrons. If they're patrons. Yeah, I well. mean we'll hear off, we'll hear from other people too. But you know, um, we pa- just want to make sure everybody it's, has a chance. It's a, it's it's a 
Like oh. we want to hear from our patrons, right? Like that's Children the, of Hurin is still very much in the lead. Children of Hurin is Tell me about that. is the lead, right? That's well this is the long version of uh Torin Torin Bar. <sighs> Which right. we first read in the Silmarillion. The Silmarillion. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's in the lead right now. So okay. had a lot of good feedback from uh, our patrons over there, which we I highly appreciate. So it's been a lot of fun. People seem really excited about what, what we'll be doing next cool. after after we're done with The Hobbit Alrighty. and all things associated with The so Hobbit. So is there a, a solid close date? I'm guessing not at this point. Uh, Not yet, but there will be soon. Okay. I'll, I'll eventually get around to it. Okay. It's on my list of stuff to do. Can't keep right. it open forever. That, that's true. Um, yeah, so I'll post a link to the uh, an article about J.A. Bayona and also his Wikipedia entry. And uh, who knows, maybe maybe next episode we'll be able to tell people we thought of the orphanage. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually really excited. Hey, about if that. you got if you got any thoughts, if you if you're a fan of his work already, if you have any thoughts about what this portends for the show, feel free to share them with us. And you know we can get the conversation going over here about uh, the Lord of the Rings Latron Prime TV show. All right. Yes, sounds good. So let's talk about chapter 17. Let's do it. The clouds burst. So chapter 16, we was really focused on Bilbo, um, Bilbo's plot to prevent a war, right? To prevent the, the dwarves and to really end the siege. And it was a little bit mysterious. We didn't entirely understand what he was trying to accomplish because basically he took the Arkenstone and, um, and gave it to bard and thranduil and we're kind of like what does he hope to accomplish by doing this right. it gets a little clearer in this chapter right he his his goal seems to be that he wants to like, by giving the arkenstone to uh to thorin's enemies he's going to then be able to offer his own share of the horde right his own fair share of the horde and return for the arkenstone Right. So he's trying to strike a deal here. Right. Where he, he gives his share of the treasure to Bard and the lake, people of Lake Town. Right. Right. Hoping on behalf to, of Thorin. On behalf of Thorin. And then the lake men return the, or Bard returns the Arkenstone and they get their share and everybody lives happily ever after. Yeah. And war is avor- averted. Right. Yes. That's pretty brilliant. I, I like I like Bilbo's thought process. Yeah, um, it, it is, and you know it again shows that um, that Bilbo. I, I I mean, to me, this is a very um, this this is almost like a kind of maybe not maybe not a hundred percent like analogous, but it strikes me as a like King Solomon kind of action, right? You know the the, uh-huh. the classic like with King the Solomon baby. story of like. The two women arguing over the mm-hmm. child and who the child belongs to, and it's like, well, yeah, I'll just, I'll just divide the child up in half, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which you know he wasn't really going to do, um, but you know it allows him. The wisdom of it is, it's like one of the people is like, I don't, I refuse. Fine, divide him, divide the child in half, and the other one's like, you know, okay, here, like she can have the child. I just, just don't, don't hurt you know, him. And who's who's more truly motherly, regardless right. of who the biological mother is, right? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a little bit of that flavor going on here yes, with Bilbo's action. I, I agree. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like, I, I don't, I, I would like to just get home. Right. right? <laughs> Alive. And right. so if I have to give up my fair share of the treasure in order to accomplish this, then so be it. Right? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I think that's a, it is. It's very wise and it's very unselfish. Yeah. Because I mean, really, in the grand scheme, what, I mean, I'm sure he could find something to do with a 14th share of gold and treasure. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is he always, he already lives a very comfortable life, mm-hmm. you know, and he just wants to get back to it. So it's not like whether or not he has his 14th share is going to drastically change his future. Yeah. It could even complicate it to be completely honest. Well, and it, and it just continues to further this whole notion that's key to the sto- to these stories of the third age that the hobbits play this important role of being like, insignificant and overlooked in the eyes mm-hmm. of the great and the powerful uh, but they end up having a, they end up playing a critical role maybe because yeah. of that very reason because they aren't nor- they aren't normally thinking on the, le- the same level as the kings and you know the and the governors and the great right. powers of the yeah. world right mm-hmm. they think mm-hmm. on a much like simpler level and it doesn't become this big like 
prideful mess for them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so obviously, um, so Thorin and, uh, so, so Bard and the Elven King call for a meeting with Thorin and cause Thorin is not aware that yet that they have the Arkenstone. Right. And, um, and they reveal it. They reveal that they have the Arkenstone. And um, and Thorne is not happy about this, right? No, yeah, it's kind of an understatement, actually. Yeah. Bilbo, yeah. Bilbo doesn't hide the fact that he was the one um, that allowed this to happen, right? And by doing Very so, brave yeah, by doing part. so, he basically ensures that Thorne isn't going to like him anymore. Yeah. So yeah, all the goodwill he's built up with Thorne and probably the other dwarves as well, you know, he recognizes that he's just throwing it out the window. Well, he also probably recognizes that that's really any goodwill that he had is hanging in the balance anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, Thorne has turned on him several times before now right. for much less. Right. So he probably realizes like, yeah, I might think I have their goodwill, but who even knows for sure? Mm-hmm. Because I've lost it before, you know, exactly. like it's not a super sure thing when you're dealing with Thorne. Right. He's kind of an unknown quantity. Yeah. So this is a good gamble on Bilbo's part. I agree. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Thorin curses Bilbo uh, and and then curses Gandalf, not realizing that he's right there with them. So and, and right. so finally Gandalf re- is revealed to everyone, to all parties, um, and defends defends Bilbo and his action. And uh and ultimately Thorin is basically realizes that he's got you know, he's got to play ball here, right? That if he wants to get the Arkenstone back, you know, he basically he's been you know, he's been successfully out, outmaneuvered here. Yeah. He's been outwitted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's not happy about it. Uh, he feels betrayed and, but he agrees to give the 14th share of the hoard in silver and gold, um, setting aside the gems. I wonder if Bilbo hoped in his heart that maybe by this action, he would even be able to soften Thorin's heart. Hmm. It, it, it may be probably not the, probably not the number one thing that you're hoping will happen because it's unlikely. Yeah. Cause he knows how much, Thorn, how much the Arkenstone, Arkenstone kind of had a, has a hold over Thorin's heart, but maybe he's thinking a little bit. You know, maybe if he's if Thorin sees that I'm willing to give up my own share of the treasure, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. in order to like resolve this peacefully, maybe he'll have a change of heart. Right. Yeah. I mean, could could Bilbo have just gone to Thorin in the first place and said, "Just give them my share of treasure," right? I don't think so because mm-hmm. I think Thorin would have been like, "No, it's the principle of the thing." Right. Mm-hmm. I will not allow you. I will not allow you to, you know, then it would have become a pride thing for, for Thor. I mean, do you think that's right? That's, that's an, yeah, I do. I do. That's an, that's a really interesting consideration. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that before, but I think you're right. I don't, I don't think, I think Thor would have just totally brushed him off. Had Gan, had um, Bilbo gone to him without taking the Arkenstone as a bargaining chip. Um, Yeah. Because, it would. It would go against pretty much everything that Thorin stands for, right? Yeah. Um, but now that the Arkenstone is in play, I don't know. I don't know that that even if Bilbo had allowed himself to hope a little bit that mm-hmm. maybe this could change Thorin, I don't think he. I don't think. I think he knew Thorin well enough to know that. You know, he's he's gonna. It was probably even still a long shot. I, for him to agree to this, as, as we as we talk about this, I think I could see somebody. You know, you know the the annoying thing that that like um, trolls, like internet trolls do. Whether it's like, um, why didn't they just have the eagles fly them to Mordor and drop the ring? You know, <laughs> right, Durr. right, right. Um, you know, that strikes me as like somebody could come out could come out and be like. Why didn't Bilbo just offer his 14th share of treasure without taking the Arkenstone over to them in the first place? And and again, I think that's one of those things where people will think they're really like they've outsmarted Tolkien or something like that in terms of the storytelling. Well, it just shows that they don't know Thorin very well. Well, exactly. And and I think the truth is that like somebody like that that that's one of the themes of this work is that these people of great stature, right? Suppo- like supposedly great stature and like the powerful and wise governors and kings of the world, they often like let like they get they're made stupid by these weird sorts of 
pride issues. And, mm-hmm. and that's, I think that's true of just about anybody. We get into these, you know, negotiations over things and, and it just, where it could be so much simpler, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. If your heart wasn't bound up with all these things, right? So true. If your heart wasn't so tied up in all of them. So, you know, I guess, I guess like if somebody were to make that argument, I would just, you know, I would just rebut it by saying like, I don't think you understand how the minds of powerful people often work. Mm -hmm. Right. And, Mm -hmm. you know, again, I think if if Bilbo had just been like, Hey, just let me just give them my 14th share. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think Thorin's response would have been, no, it's the principle of the thing. It's the principle. Right? They have to earn it, right? <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, it w- it would have it would have gone against, really, what, yeah, what he stands for, yeah, and what he believes in. I don't know. It's an interesting bit of speculation to me now that I kind of think about it on the spot. But it's a good question, though. Anyway, kind of a rabbit trail because it's nowhere really brought up in the text. But it, but I could I can see. I mean, the question did spring to my mind: like, was it really necessary for Bilbo? Why didn't he just offer his 14th share in the first place? And and um, is that all that the lake men are demanding as a 14th share, or are they demanding more? I don't know. If they ever demanded like specific, like a specific amount. Uh, For some reason, I thought maybe it was more. I don't know. Like a 14th may not have been. Maybe maybe the lake men wouldn't have gone in for that. With without the Arkenstone. It's a lot, I don't know. right? I mean, it's there's a huge hoard of treasure there's in the mountain, right? There's a huge so. hoard, yeah. So yeah, in, in normal in normal circumstances, the fourteenth doesn't sound like a whole lot, but right. with the huge amount that was un- that's under the mountain, it would be quite a bit. You're right. Yeah, um, yeah. every little bit helps. It does. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so so they all part ways, and well, Thorne agrees to it. Thor- right? Thorne, Thorne agrees. does grudgingly agrees to it. To give them Bilbo's share in return right. for the Arkenstone. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, no signs. Can we just mention real quick yeah. how funny it is that really the worst insult that Thorne could come up with on the spot for Bilbo was an undersized burglar. <laughs> <laughs> undersized burglar. <laughs> you just think of how wronged he feels, you know? Right. And that's like the worst he can do. You undersized burglar. You. Well, then he calls him like a descendant of rats, too. Rabbit. So. A rab- doesn't he call him a descendant of rabbits? No, he says rats. I thought he said rabbit. Mm-mm. Okay. Oh, descendant of rats. Or maybe indeed. he's, is he calling... Yeah, you're right. Maybe he's calling, I don't know if he's calling Bilbo or Gandalf that, actually. Hmm. Maybe he's calling Gandalf that. Because it's after his exchange with Gandalf. And he says, to, he says, you all seem in league, said Thorin, dropping Bilbo on the top of the wall. Never again will I have dealings with any wizard or his friends. What have you to say, you descendant of rats? So, yeah, yeah. I don't know who he's talking to, but even so. Well, yeah, the the, hob- the rabbit thing came from right after the, you miserable hobbit, you undersized burglar. He shouted at a loss for words, and he shook poor Bilbo like a rabbit. Oh, like, yeah, he shook him like a rabbit, right. Um, but yeah, I would say I, descendant I like of rats loss- is much more insulting than descendant of rabbits. Yeah, I like the loss of words. Uh, where he's, Thorin is just like you, undersized burglar. burglar. <laughs> right. It's kind that, of a doesn't fun, that happen? It, it seems does seem like, like a comedic scene. It kind know. of, it kind of does. It definitely lightens the mood a little bit. But I'm like, I feel like that when you're really put on the spot and when you're really angry and you just really want like just that perfect jab, you know? Right. You can never think of it on the spot. It always comes to you, like you know. Yeah. Minutes or days later and you're like, Oh, that's what I should have said. But right. maybe it's the grace of God that keeps us from really saying what we want to in those I, circumstances. I, I, can't, I can't quote this because we want to maintain our clean rating, but uh the it makes me think of the uh, kind of it, it reminds me of the thing from Happy Gilmore with the <laughs> I eat pieces of like, oh, you from breakfast. Right. And he's like, You eat pieces of from yeah. breakfast. Yeah. So sometimes those jobs can kind of be turned right. and yeah, flung turned back you. at you. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so moving on, um, yeah, so an ugly truce, yeah, so, so things are pretty icy, and all this time, like, Thorin was counting on Dine showing up, right, Dine showing up with his men mm. from the east, with, right, with his, uh, dwarf army from the east, and, and, and Thorin is still kind of thinking about that, it's almost like he's got his fingers crossed behind his back about this whole trade, right, because the trade hasn't actually happened yet, and, um, and 
he uh, Thorin sends messengers by Roik telling Dan of what had passed and bidding him come with wary speed. So uh, the armies of Dain uh, show up and um, and everybody's things are getting pretty tense between all the different armies. Well, Bard won't let them through. Right. Right? He won't let the armies of Dain through because they have to go through him. Mm-hmm. Right? And... Um, uh, yeah, and and he doesn't he doesn't let them, right? Right. So that's kind of the first big anti. You know, that's the first sign that war is imminent. I think. Yeah. Is when Bard refuses admittance to the to Dane, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to make sure I read that correctly. Well, the siege is the first sign, and then and well, then, the siege, yes, and then Bard refusing to let him go past. Um, he didn't want. He's not going to let him pass until they until they get the exchange. Right. Until the exchange is made. Right. And then he sends people. Right. For the gold, and instead he gets arrows. Mm-hmm. So has Thorin broken his word at this point? Like he has he he's gone back on his word. It would seem so. Yeah. Which is surprising to me. Right. I really felt like he w- was good for it. Yeah. So this was disappointing. Yeah, I mean, I kind of read into it that he was that he was just biding his time. Um, yeah. That was probably, yeah, that's more in, in line with the th- character of Thor and that we've come to know. Exactly. So um, now the Elf King is is probably the least wanting war at this point of the three, right? Yeah. Of, of the dwarves and the men and the elves. Um, he says, long will I tarry ere I begin this war for gold. The dwarves cannot pass us unless we will or do anything that we cannot mark. Let us hope to still for something that will bring reconciliation. Our advantage in numbers will be enough if in the end it com- must come to happy to unhappy blows. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, the dwarves are pretty much ready. They are ready to have it out. And so yeah. um, it does come to blows. So just as, uh, just as the Elven King says this, um, the dwarves spring silently forward to attack. Bows twanged and arrows whistled. Battle was about to be joined. And even as this happens, something comes, uh, it gets even cloudier. A black cloud hurried over the sky. Winter thunder on a wild wind rolled roaring up and rumbled in the mountain, and lightning, lightning lit its peak. And beneath the thunder, another blackness could be seen whirling forward. But it did not come with the wind. It came from the north like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could be seen between their wings. And Gandalf calls them to halt. And they realize that and he calls and lets them know that the goblins are upon them. Right. The goblins have come. Uh, the bats are above are uh, the, there's bats above. Uh, I guess big nasty bats like a sea mm-hmm. of locusts. Yeah. And uh, the goblins ride upon wolves and wargs. So. Yikes. Yeah. So it turns out this whole time that there's been a goblin army kind of on the heels of dying that he didn't know about. Right. And yeah, uh, they have they've sprung upon them just as the dwarves are getting ready to attack the men and the elves. Right. Now, has has this been hinted at in previous chapters? I feel like the, the, go- the goblins have been mentioned. Well, yeah. Like, because, we knew this was a like possibility. Like, under the Misty Mountains, and they're mentioned elsewhere. Um, but this was not... I don't think there was any, like, specific word of, go- of like, a goblin army marching right. upon Erebor. But I think they knew it was a possibility, Now, now we, right? had, we had heard that word was kind of getting around. Yeah, right? about and smog. smog and, right, yeah. yeah. And so it says a little bit about this. It goes into a little bit about what this army is doing showing up here. It says, um, this is how it fell out. Ever since the fall of the great goblin of the Misty Mountains, the hatred of their race for the dwarves had been rekindled to fury. Messengers had passed to and fro between all their cities, colonies, and strongholds, for they resolved now to win the, dominate, the dominion of the north. Tidings they had gathered in secret ways, and in all the mountains there was a forging and an arming. Then they marched and gathered by hill and valley, going ever by tunnel or under dark, until around and beneath the great mountain Gundabad of the north, where was their capital, a vast host was assembled, ready to sweep down in time of storm unawares upon the south. Then they learned of the death of Smaug, and joy was in their hearts, and they hastened night after night through the mountains, and came thus at last on a sudden from the north, hard on the heels of dying. Not even the ravens knew of their coming until they came out in the broken lands, which divided the lonely mountain from the hills behind. How much Gandalf uh, knew cannot be said, but it is plain that he had not expected this sudden assault. So Gandalf calls 
uh, it, it realizing the goblins are here, calls the elves and the dwarves and the humans together, and uh, and the men together, and uh, and plots a quick plan to deal with this goblin onslaught because this is a right. big army. This yeah. is a big goblin army, mm-hmm. uh, and so it's it's worth. Um, this is where I'm going to go back to our one of my favorite books, uh, which is Fonstad's Atlas of Middle Earth. And this is one with all the maps in it. Mm. Um, it's it's worth picking up a copy of this uh, to understand, you know, the order of battle and kind of the layout of how this all works. Uh, there's a really good there's a really good map in here on the battle of the five armies, and you can kind of see the layout of the mountain, and 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 just picture in your mind like the mountain is is star shaped. If you know, there's a a north, um, a, a north spur, and then there's an uh, an a western spur and then a they what they call the southern spur is kind of actually southwestern and what they call the eastern spur is more um is more southeastern and then there's an actual eastern like directly eastern spur i think i've got my my compass bearings right there at least there's actually no compass on this map but but that's how it's oriented if you assume mm. the north is zero degrees right um and so the elves it's part of this plan. They put themselves on the south, what's called the southern spur in the book, but it's it's the one that points southwestern. And then the men and the dwarf and Dine's army put themselves on the what's called the eastern spur, which is set, pointing southeast. Not all the dwarves, right? Just Dine's. Right. Group. And so they kind of make way for the goblins to come right at the main entrance of the mountain, right of the lonely mountain. Right. And their plan is to then once once they're in that valley to spring Attack upon from them both from sides. the top. Right. Yeah. So kind of trap they're, they're creating a trap yes which is probably their best bet since mm-hmm. it's a larger army mm-hmm. yeah right so um we'll, i'm gonna say this real quick and then we'll talk more about the battle bilbo really is like oh good heavens what have i gotten myself into and he's like <laughs> he's, he's just like, trying to stay out of the way <laughs> he's like i <laughs> finally thought that maybe i was going to be able to survive all of this and now it looks even worse than it's ever looked um so he basically puts on his ring and tries to stay out of the way the whole time yep um, and he kind of he kind of hangs out with Gandalf and and the elves. He puts and himself elves, right. because it's that south southwestern spur, yeah, from which he thinks there's probably the best chance of escape. Exactly, which exactly. I like the way Bilbo's thinking. I think I would have done the same thing. Well, yeah, it's like trying to get a seat near the exit, you know, in a big at a big concert or something. Yeah, it's like how in worst case scenario, what's or at the least easiest par- way out? Park Park near the exit. Or at least park near the exit. Yeah. Yeah. Or now, sit near. That's why everybody likes an outside seat, too. Yeah. Right? Whether it be an airplane or a pew or, you know, some kind of aisle. Everybody likes the aisle seats. Mm-hmm. Some people like the window seat. Some people you do. You can see cooler stuff You can on the see cooler seat. stuff. And I guess your knee doesn't get hit with the beverage cart on an airplane if you're on the window seat. But I don't know. I, I always prefer to sit on the end. Sorry. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just nice knowing. It's like a mental thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I can get out of here quickly should a need arise. I don't have to climb over a bunch of people. So Bilbo's smart. That's where that rabbit trail was winding up. He's uh, he's wise. He understands that he's not like the greatest warrior here right you know, so but he is it might be he's good still for wearing him to that, stay out of the way that mail right yeah that thorn gave him he is. so he's he is wearing, protected he's wearing the mithril or mithril um, right so that's good uh it's mail so you're yeah. right oh, okay just, i was being more specific got it so um yeah it it's it's cool if you want to pick up fonstad's atlas on this but yeah just just picture that star in your mind and then on the two bottom spurs of the star you know this this lonely mountain you've got the elves on the left side and the dwarves and men on the right side and the goblins coming up to the bottom uh of the star and so the 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 elves spring first the elves spring the trap first and um and so they're attacking the goblin army on the left on the goblin army's left side right 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 and just as the goblins are kind of starting like they you know they, they get kind of the elves do some damage and just as the goblins are starting to kind of recover and regroup on that side then the men and, and Dine's army descend from the other spur. Yeah. And so the trap begins and the elves redouble their efforts and that really trap begins. And things look like it's going pretty well actually for the good guys, right? Yeah. Looks like they might actually win. Yeah, things things seem to be going pretty well. And then just as that happens, 
there's a there was an army that broke off from the goblin army north of the mountain right and they actually came up over top right so uh the larger portion of the goblin army went around the eastern side of the mountain in the in the foothills and came up that way but unknown to the rest of the party there was a significant portion of that army that broke off north of the mountain and came over uh, more or less over the top of the mountain. And so they're actually coming down uh, on the, the spurs that the elves, the elves and the men and the dwarves were on and had achieved adva- their advantage from the heights. So they're attacking from above. They're attacking from above, yeah. which is always That's an advantage. U- usually yeah. an advantage, in, uh, mm-hmm. especially in, in that ancient kind of warfare. So um, this presents a problem and things, uh, you know, that's it. You know, the, the whole idea here is to like get get to somebody's flank, get get to the get to the area that they're leaving unguarded, right, or relatively unguarded, right, right, right. Um, and so, and that's what the elves and and men and dwarves had done to, um, had had done to the goblin army on the and the first thing, right? They they attacked them from the sides, which is where they're most vulnerable, right. And then, and then now here, the the goblin army that came over the top is attacking, you know, from the sides on the spurs where they weren't planning for anybody to be attacking them. Right. So right? they're kind of cornered right now. If, if the yeah. whole, if the whole goblin army mm-hmm. had gone around the mountain, they'd be sitting pretty right about now. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. the, yeah, the, 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 the good, good guys. guys, the good guys, the good would. guys. Yeah. But it's really that second offensive mm-hmm. from above. That's, that's hurting them. Yes. Yes, indeed. So, um, but then this Thorin, Thorin comes out, right? Right. right. So in response to yeah, Thorin with his the overhead attack with the his small his small little band of, of dwarves. They do come riding out from the from the mouth of or from the main gate, and uh, right at the goblin army. So you know things are it's a pretty it's a big melee right now, right? It's a big mess of, of battle going on right there. Yeah. Outside the main gate, and Thorin and his group comes out, and Thorin calls all these. Um, uh, Thorn calls, you know, kind of ev- all of the the free peoples, right, to to muster to him and and to continue to take the battle. And Thorn, you know, Thorn's a solid warrior. He's really doing some damage. Um, you know, they're really going and and taking, uh, it's kicking taking butt the, and taking names, taking the fight to the enemy. But mm-hmm. but it's only a few of them, right? It's not a big yeah. army. Yeah. So, um, so even at this, things are still not looking good, and um. And then there's really, it's looking like things are going to be getting to a last stand, unfortunately. So um, the goblin army is just too big, really, to, um, you know, to, to, to stand up against, it would seem. Yeah. Um, it says Bilbo is, watch, is kind of watching all this unfold. And he calls, uh, or he's thinking to himself, it will not be long now before the goblins win the gate and we are all slaughtered or driven down and captured. Really, it is enough to make uh, to make one weep after all one has gone through. I would, I would rather old Smog had been left with all the wretched treasure than that these vile creatures should get it and poor old Bomber and Balin and Feely and Keely and all the rest come to a bad end. And Bard too and the Lake Men and the Merry Elves. Misery me. I've heard songs of many battles and I've always understood that defeat may be glorious. It seems very uncomfortable not to say distressing. I wish I was well out of it. Yeah, so things are not looking uh things are not looking good at all. No. At this point. It's kind of re- they're kind of resigned to defeat right at this point. Um and uh and and Gandalf and Bilbo, you know, Bilbo's really thought process is like like you were saying earlier, I'll be with the Elf King. This is my best chance of making an escape because he is on the um you know, he's on the southwestern spur. So mm-hmm. You know, there's he has a ch- Bilbo has a chance at least to make a break for it to the west, right? I mean, what are the chances though? If even if he escapes, he's not going to be able to survive. Well, the journey home. At least he has a fighting chance. But at right? least he has a fighting chance. But, exactly. But even if he can't, he could at least make a last stand defending the Elven King, which is apparently what he prefers in all this. So, so the um just to clarify, so elves are immortal mm-hmm. unless they're killed. Yeah, exactly. right, right, right. So all the elves that have died in this battle are dead. Yeah, doesn't it say something in there about It does. The, it the says fair... something about elves that that should like there was many um uh yeah, that there were that there were many that there was among the goblin heaps there was still piled um 
that there were still, you know, men and elves who should have lived many years more um, were among the were among right. the lost. Right. Yep. I can't find the exact words. That's but. all right. I remember. It. Yeah, I remember it being in there. Um, yeah. So, um, and just as Bilbo is kind of having these dark, dark and gloomy thoughts and realizing that the end might be nigh, um, it says the clouds were torn by the wind and a red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom, Bil- I like that, the gleam in the gloom, Bilbo looked around. He gave a great cry. He had seen a sight that made his heart leap, dark shaped, small yet majestic against the distant glow. The eagles, the eagles, he shouted. The eagles are coming. Bilbo's eyes were seldom wrong. The eagles were coming down the wind, line after line, in such a host as must have gathered from all the eyries of the north. So apparently a huge army of eagles. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that is a very encouraging sign. Yeah. But unfortunately for Bilbo, um, a stone came hurtling from above right at this moment and smote heavily on his helm and he fell with a crash and knew no more. So he has been concussed. Well, but something bad has happened to him. He at now. least, well, the, yeah, at the least I guess he's been concussed, but at least he got word out about the eagles. Yeah. So there is hope. That That's, there is hope. Yeah. Yes. Um, this so, is what we would refer to in Tolkien language as a you catastrophic event. Yes, most definitely. Yes. Um, I think I was reading in the... Uh, I was reading in the annotated Hobbit that um, that this like Tolkien was really proud. He wrote a letter, I think, to Christopher at one point, saying that he was really proud. Like it was when he wrote this this scene that he really knew he had something special because he was able to work in this big you catastrophic you catastrophic moment, and he was really proud of that. Um, oh, okay. Coming up here, so so okay, maybe. But haven't the eagles shown up before? Not in uh, well. Was that in Lord of the Rings? Yeah, well, when in they Lord were of the cornered Rings. by the right. The wolves? It, that's in Lord of the Rings. That's which, in Lord of the Rings. That's not going to be written. Now the eagles do show up in the Hobbit uh, prior to this, right? But not in the same you catastrophic. Not not in this. It's definitely not in the same you catastrophic way as it is here. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was wondering if I was getting my books confused because I thought but, we had seen the eagles before. But there can be more. Well, yeah, and they're they're much. It's much more you catastrophic and um, well. Th- th- I'm not not much more, but it's um, it's another big uh, eucatastrophic moment in Lord of the Rings. Okay, so wait, where is it when they're like the trees are on fire, and they're cornered that's, by the wolves? That's on the um, eastern side of. But that's of, in the Hobbit. Uh, the Misty Mountains. Yeah, that is in the Hobbit, but it's also remember in the movie, it's much more like kind of dramatized than yeah, okay. it is maybe in the book. Got it. So they're, okay. they're saved. I mean, that does happen, but it's um, they're saved by the eagles. They're in those trees, right? And, yes. And they're yeah. about to get burned out by the right. goblins, and right. the, and the eagles come and save them. Right. So, okay. I thought that was okay. So it is a catastrophe to be sure. Yeah, but this it's, is just it's an a greater un- unexpected turn of events towards the good. When for- all hope is lost. Fortune. Yeah. There's yeah, there's a a bright twist of fate. Right. Salvation yes. at hand. Exactly. Got it. Yeah, so that is that is chapter seventeen. Pretty pretty exciting and eventful chapter. Yeah, cliffhanger. Um, any more thoughts on that chapter you want to share with the listeners, Greta? Yeah, I don't think so. All right, I think we I think we uh, covered it all. Well, let's do some haiku. All right, let's do it. Here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables in haiku. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 syllables in haiku. Oh. All right. All right, indeed. Time for the latest installment of uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Rock, Rock paper, paper, Scissors, scissors shoot. shoot. Woohoo, I win. You win. You go first. Me? Okay. Yeah, you. All right. Ark and stone betrays hearts of stone. Common foe frees prisoners of greed. Hmm. Common foe frees prisoners of greed. Hmm. I like that. I was trying to figure out who the common foe is. Uh, the orcs. 
You mean the goblins? The goblins. The, uh, oh, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. That's really good. Well done. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Here's mine. Five armies battle. Defeat looms large. But then, here they come. The eagles. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, thanks. All right. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. Time for some correspondence. We need a correspondence theme song. Oh, I... Correspondence, correspondence, about, correspondence. I'm fresh out of theme songs correspondence, today. Correspondence, correspondence, correspondence. All right. There we go. There you go. There's, there's your <laughs> correspondence theme song. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Hey, it's better than dead airspace, right? Um, Maybe. That remains to be seen. Oh, yikes. Yikes. Burn. You asked for it. I did. I did. I'll come up with something better next time. Um, all right. So the first note I am going to share is from, as a Facebook note, and it is from a listener, and it's not coming up. Hmm. Great. Just great Facebook. Well, I'd offer to help you, but I don't know how to get on Facebook. You don't book it to face. I don't book it to face. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll come back to that. Um, we'll come to the correspondence that is in the email inbox. I feel like I'm talking like Perd happily right now. You actually are. <laughs> All right. Uh, first note is from Jennifer, who uh, has corresponded corresponded with us um, for the last few episodes. And uh, Jennifer has some thoughts to share on Chapter 16, A Thief in the Night, the previous chapter. Uh, she says, Tolkien did not like cliffhanger endings, and he wanted to tie up loose ends. That is why he wrote more chapters after the dragon's death. Hmm. Even traditional fairy stories and folk tales do not have cliffhangers. It was not until The Hobbit was published that the idea of a sequel was suggested to him by the publishers. At first, he didn't see any need for more about Hobbits, but then he decided to try it out. Um, uh, so that's the first part. And then she also mentions, uh, one more thing, did you know that Tolkien translated several Catholic prayers into High Elvish, Quenya, and Old English? There's a website that has all the phrases, words, poems, songs, and more in all of the Tolkien languages, including Old Gothic, Welsh, and Finnish. Um, yeah, I was aware of a little bit of that, but, um, but it's... Uh, that's really cool, and um, uh, and, and it's I've, I've heard some of them, and they're very beautiful to hear. Oh that, wow, so. that's awesome! Um, and good point about Tolkien not liking cliffhanger endings. I'm not a big fan of like, um, I, I I'm not a big I I like cliffhanger endings, but I don't like the type of ending where it's just like the story's over and now we're done. I like a long denouement, and that's another thing mm-hmm. I appreciate about Tolkien. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, it would be interesting to hear him think, to hear him comment about whether the whether the, the portion of the story after the death of Smaug is is all denouement, or if the climax of the story is actually in a different point, or whether he even like buys into that theory of storytelling anyway. Um, but uh, but thanks for sharing, Jennifer, and always good to hear from you. Indeed, yes, thank so, you. So, and I got Facebook to work. So this is from this is from Radek, and Radek, uh, Radek is. Uh, Polish, and um, I I would try to say his last name, but I, I'm afraid I'd butcher it, so I'll just say Radek S. And I think I'm saying your first name right. I hope so. Uh, but he's he's actually corresponded with us before, and um, uh, let's see. He he wrote in to say um, he listened to every single episode of the podcast on Spotify, uh, and he said he was listening to the last episode. It was highly entertaining as ever, but I couldn't contain myself on John's note about all the people trying to uh, file him. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> so oh. I'm glad somebody I'm glad somebody out there appreciated my uh, my sense of humor. Um, and he said I must have been looking very peculiar walking around because he he actually lives in Sweden. Um, oh, okay. So another interesting. We have two listeners we've heard from recently who live in sweden but are from, from somewhere another else. european country so interesting huh, yeah uh but he says he was walking around the platform of stockholm's commuter train uh that morning and laughing i guess <laughs> while he while he was listening <laughs> to us talk about um uh, yeah about your 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 pun your yes pun, your puns and your your punished sense of humor exactly yeah well good always good to hear from you radic yes thanks for the note and uh let me know if i mispronounced your name I feel like I'm getting it wrong, so uh, I want to make sure I get it right next time. This stuff's important to me. Mm-hmm. As it should be, since this is 
podcast about Tolkien. Boom. Mm-hmm. Um, next note is from Ben, uh, our buddy Ben, who is a longtime correspondent with us. Uh, and I guess I guess he must be a senior or going into his senior year or uh, that must be what it is because he says, for my senior quote, I'm going to put, I don't know half of you as well as I should like and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Perfect. I think that is the Perfect. ultimate best uh, senior yearbook quote to leave. I wish I had, I, I wish would, I had been a Tolkien fan so I could have left that myself. But, yeah, I know. I'm like at goosebumps. That's so good. Yeah. I know. I wish I had done that. Well, it's like the perfect just send off to all like the way you likely feel about all of your high school classmates. You know, there's exactly. there's some of them you like, but probably there's a lot that you don't like very much. Yeah. You probably <laughs> And probably like... some that you just kind of feel like I'm not really sure how I feel about them and so you just kind of want to leave them all thinking. Which is just perfect. That's the yeah. beauty of that quote. Totally. Is it's it's like it really is like a mild diss, but like by the time people think like you have to think about it and by the time they figure it out, you've already departed so they can't express how insulted they feel to your face. But what's great about it, remember we did the math on this one time. We did. And we realized it was actually like a compliment. It was a compliment. Yeah. That's, it was but actually a very sa- kind thing to say when you when you resolved all the language. Like, Yes, like, well, with all the haves and the likes and right. yeah, it's a I bit complicated. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, so that's a compliment. That is right? a compliment, yeah. Like I wish I knew more of you better. That's the first half, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. So that one's that was the funny part of it because like right. he's admitting that he likes he likes these people. He he knows that they sh- he should like them more, but he likes in reality he likes them less than he should. But it's less than half. Right. So he actually likes more than half of them that's as true. they deserve. Yeah. But it's still, yeah, that's, that's what the beauty of it. The ambiguity, the ambigu, what is it? Ambiguity. The ambiguity of that the ambiguity yeah. of it. Um, and it sounds very like, uh, yeah, it, it just sounds very proper. Yeah. You know, it's a very proper and it's, it's, it's one of the all-time great, statement. great lines from Tolkien. It um, is. And it's a perfect senior year outgoing message yeah for sure well so, done well done ben if you do get that in there ben send us a uh send us a snapshot of it and uh so we can so we can maybe share it with some folks because i'd love to see that in the yeah. yearbook so absolutely um next note is from greg simonson greg and um been hearing a lot from greg on facebook lately so it's good to get a little longer email from him um he said hope all are well while listening to the episode about a thief in the night i had a thought bilbo is the only one in the situation willing to give up anything Upon hearing of Smaug's death, everyone's first thought is, hey, there's lots of treasure in that mountain. I'm going to go get me some. And although some, like Bard, may have begun with good intentions, it has escalated to the point, if anyone makes a wrong move, there will be a battle. Um, he says maybe a foreshadowing of the rings effect. Mm. But Bilbo is willing to sacrifice all claim he has on the treasure as well as the dwarves' good opinion of him and go home with nothing if it will help resolve the situation. This causes the Elven King and Bard to look at him differently and realize that this is a good and noble being. Well so, said. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um and he wishes to me that may your beard grow ever longer. And he specifies John. And uh and the <laughs> Thank stars, you for clarifying. The stars Greg. shine upon your faces, which presumably you are included in. Okay, good. So yeah. So I'm only exempted from the beard. Yeah. The beard wish. Okay. I mean, maybe if you had a theor- theoretically if you had a beard that it would grow <laughs> ever longer, right? That would be weird. That would um, I'm I'm personally very glad oh, you but that, have a beard. But that reminds me for the in this chapter when it talks about the army of Dine coming yeah. in, it talks about them having their beards tucked into their belts. Oh yeah. So that that those are some long beards. Well, remember in uh, I don't know if this is actually in the book, but there's the funny scene in Lord of the Rings where uh, Gimli's like, "Careful of the beard!" Like like I think. Um, oh yeah. Legolas or somebody is like holding onto his beard to save his life. Yes. And he's like, "Careful of the beard!" Right. Do not tug the beard. Right. It's also. Uh, was it St. Thomas More when he was going to oh, be beheaded? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do not chop the beard, he, for he has done yeah. nothing wrong. Oh, yes. wait. I got to find that quote. That's a great quote. When, it's when uh, Thomas More is about to be uh, about to be beheaded. Um, beard quote. Let's see. It's, he a, says, it's a good one. Come on, Internet. You're being slow. It's being Killing really, me. really slow. Here we go. Uh, wiki quote. We'll go with this. <sighs> Big old <laughs> thing of all right. How fast? Oh, uh, I was hoping to get the whole quote, but 
uh, as he drew aside his beard, placing upon uh, placing his head upon the chopping block, um, Francis Bacon quotes him as having said, um, "This hath not offended the king." So he he pulls his beard away. So oh, that it pulls doesn't his get beard away, off. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, we kind of did a poor job of of recounting that, but I, I thought my way was okay. Oh yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I got the general gist of it, right? Which Ugh. Is, all right. Which is all about how, you know, the importance of beards in the lives of men. Yeah. yeah. Beard, beards rule. Mm-hmm. All right. So. Uh, is that it? Great hearing from you, Greg. Oh, oh. no. One more. And then Uh-oh. we had a note yes, from. Yes, thank you, Greg. We had a note from Ish of the Hammer. Ish. Um, uh, good old Ish. He wrote in to say, um, to let it say, let you know, just thought I'd write in to let you know I've been listening. Um, and he said, I had a couple of thoughts that I wanted to run past you. Uh, and the one he throws out there is on the Lord of the Ring project, uh, which is something I had heard of before, but was not really aware of, but he throws it out in response to, um, a note from, uh, one of our other listeners. Who was that? That was, um, it was, it was, uh, it was so I'm I'm kicking myself because I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. Uh, I'll find it here in a second. Anyway, he wrote in to say that there's actually a family tree um, on Lord of the Rings project. Oh, that, that was contains from the bird all, guy. Um, was that was that from? Wasn't uh, it the bird guy that was talking about the uh, family tree? Or hold not? on, uh, maybe not. I should have kept it starred. Uh, let's see here, family tree. I'll type in tree and see if I can find that in my email here. Is it tie? Uh, do, 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 do. Yes, yes, Ty Miller. Yes, it was Ty Miller. Is yes. he the bird guy? He is. Uh, he's also the one that got me going. That got me going again on the feel and file. Oh, um, that's right. And he's yeah, not so the he bird. found a bunch. Okay. So Ty, Ty had found a bunch of family trees, and then Ish wrote in to say, uh, "The LOTR project is another great place, and it's not like a you know super uh, beautiful area, but it does like connect a ton of information." And, and I had never actually taken. I had never actually taken a close look at this, but it's a really cool Whoa. website i'll link to it in the show notes that is an impressive um, tree that basically like collects i think every it looks like every character in all of uh tolkien's in all of tolkien's middle earth works wow and shows That's how they're related cool. to one another so definitely link over to that it's also got some good interactive maps on there as well to share with you so. neato yeah cool. so always good, good to hear stuff. from you ish and yes, thank you, um, ish. uh he also he, he also asked um about the concept of the long defeat and um, which is something we talked about in the Lord of the Rings a little bit, and it's something I think would be an interesting topic to cover on a future episode. Yeah, so, definitely. Um, very Tolkienian, mm-hmm. deeply Tolkienian concept mm-hmm. there. And uh, but always good to hear from you, Ish, and yeah. um, uh, and look forward to hearing more from you in the near future. Yes. All right. That so, about covers it. So hey, wrap. don't forget to leave us a five star review on iTunes. Um, hey, the, we we haven't seen any in very recently, so. Um, and I know that there's lots more folks out there who uh, listen to us and have not rated us. So if you have not left a rating for us on iTunes or your podcast listening uh, app of choice, please do so and let the world know uh, how great you think we are. Yes. So yes. it means the world please. to us. All right. Thanks again to our patrons. You all rock. Al Taylor, Andrew Herbert, Andrew Thomas, uh, Asia Veneer, Bethany Engler, Brendan Corkery, Brian Orr, Kat Lane, Chris Loftus, Chuck Farnung, Daniel Delaney, David Bigwood, David Dickinson, Emilio Perea, Eric Bissett, Hunter Johns, Ish of the Hammer, James Applegate, James Lindbergh, Joe Towns, John Rice, Josh Sosa, Lawrence McGowan, Margaret Lyon, Matt Scarrants, Robert Franks, Sarah Murphy, Shannon Stockbridge, Teresa Colangelo, Travis Lawheed, Ty Miller, Dr. William Hutton, and Zeke Farmer. We appreciate you all, and we appreciate all of our listeners. Yes, very, very much. And... We look forward to talking at you next time. Yes, we do. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all.